Welcome back to the second hour of Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again Daniel McAdams of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks for having me back, Jay. Always good to talk to you for a, a, a weekly chat and an update on what's happening, what's uh, really happening for an alternative view of, of what's taking place in the world as opposed to what our mainstream media gives us uh, all the time. You know, last evening, Daniel, I was sitting out on my patio, my wife and I, uh, it was a beautiful evening here in New York, and our next door neighbor, who we like a lot, Marianne, uh, so we started. She started talking about uh, the current events and the airliner, uh, the Malaysian airline plane that went down, and immediately she started saying, basically saying exactly what I just heard a few minutes earlier on the television inside, that Putin is responsible for the Malaysian aircraft that went down, that Putin provided the missiles that were used to shoot down the aircraft, and that Putin is not trying to stop these these horrible people in east in the eastern ukraine uh, the separatists uh, from interfering with the um, with the investigation of the of the crash in the downed airliner so i think that she's really uh as i say i think she's just really uh depending on the mainstream media for her truth and she doesn't doesn't have any reason she thinks to suspect that they are not giving it to her straight but uh, this weekend, I noticed on the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity that Ron Paul did write an article. State, the title of the article was, What the Media Won't Report About the Malaysian Airlines Flight MH17. Can you pass along for our listeners some of the, uh, the points, some of the, uh, the things that our media is not reporting that may be very crucial to understanding what really went on in this incident? Yeah, you're, you're, you're right about everything there, Jay. You know, what is amazing is the... The, the preponderance of propaganda, you know, the absolute total dominance of one perspective. You know, it was just minutes after the crash that, with one voice, Western media proclaimed that Putin did it, uh, with zero evidence. And any time there's any evidence pre- presented that, that goes counter to that pre, pre-foregone conclusion, it's simply ignored. Mm-hmm. It may well be the case. Maybe they're right. Maybe... Maybe all of the lies they've told us since Saddam's WMD and before, maybe all that aside, they're right this time. Yeah. Maybe they're being honest for a change. Maybe they are, but you would think that the burden of proof would be on them at least. But sadly, for, for folks like your neighbor and for, you know, unfortunately, the vast majority of Americans, they won't even stop to ponder that because they still believe what's told to them on the nightly news. Although, we're, you know, we're both happy to hear that that uh, audience is declining and decreasing because more and more people are smelling the, the BS, I hate to say it that way, but uh, and, and tuning out. But nevertheless, it still is uh, so dominant. Uh, but it, as you asked, Dr. Paul, in his weekly column this week, did sort of have, uh, looks to me like he had a little fun pointing out that um, here are the things, you know, the media is propagandizing and telling you what happened. Here's a few things that they're not going to report. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think one of the um, one of the first ones he points out, it's, which is so important, is that this whole thing started with the EU and the U.S. who were clamoring for regime change. They started in the early 2000s with the Orange Revolution, and they upped the ante with the coup that happened in February. And as he points out. Uh, if it wasn't for U.S. and E.U. meddling in the overthrow of a democratically elected president, you would not have had the violence in the East, where the people in the East say, we don't want to go along with this government put in place in the western part of Ukraine, uh, so we're going to resist. Um, yeah. Wouldn't have yeah. had that, and you most likely would not have had this plane uh, shot down. Well, you know, Daniel, that's what uh, Putin said, in fact, after this uh, tragic event he said if there if there was peace in the ukraine this wouldn't have happened which is an obvious statement but then we need to back up and americans are not aware as you said uh, of what our role has been in destabilizing an elected government over there people well, don't know that i mean true. i mean I, I guess we're not supposed to know um you know what our government or what um i don't know people that are behind our government are doing well they assume that we're stupid but, you know, the same is true in every other, in, in all of the other interventions we see now falling apart. Um, they don't want us to know that uh, in Iraq, for example, it's the same ISIS that they're supporting to overthrow Assad that is destroying the country. Right. They don't want us to know that the same Islamic rebels in Libya that they backed to overthrow Gaddafi 
have now taken the airport uh, in Tripoli, have killed some, I think, 40-some people yesterday, and that the place is a total disaster. So they don't want Americans to think about the consequences of the intervention. They immediately want to simply change the topic and point out the Hitler of the day. Or as they define him. Yes, as they define him. You're right. And they decide to put the label Hitler on people, whether it's justified or not. Um, and, and many times it is, I suppose. But then, you know, two wrongs make a right, I suppose. Sure. Uh, there, are a lot of ba- there are a lot of bad guys out there. Uh, and simply being interested in facts and being skeptical of all governments does not make one on the side of, of anyone. But, Daniel, you know darn well that our government couldn't be bad, that we have only good people that live in, uh, that occupy the White House. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we, but we, we have that sense all the time. Uh, that's the way, that's the way we're brought up to believe. I can remember as a young man always knowing for sure that is Vestia and Pravda were the liars, but our people and our, our uh, media was giving us the straight truth. I always felt that way. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a shame, but now I guess unfortunately the veil has been lifted from our eyes. I think Iraq did a lot in 2002 and 2003, did a lot for a lot of people to lift the veil. Uh, and, and I think, especially for me, you know, after that incident, I really started going back and looking at interventions through history, and you see the same pattern over and over again. All right, another, uh, another point that Ron Paul pointed out was that uh, in terms of the weapons that were used, he says that they will not report that the Ukrainian government also uses the exact same Russian-made weapons that, were, uh, that are believed to have brought down the plane. I know that's, a, that's a really good one, I think, because the media, at least over the weekend, was, uh, was, was going on. We know that, that Putin did it because they used Russian weapons. Yeah. It shows how ignorant, how ignorant the media is, how ignorant these people are. Of course, Ukraine uses the same left weapons because most of them were Soviet weapons. Yeah. They were both together as part of the Soviet Union. You know? So, of course, Ukraine has these, uh, these surface-to-air missiles, these sophisticated Buk missiles. Uh, you know, they, they all use them. Yeah, but of course, we're, the general idea that American people have is that our side, the Ukrainians, uh, it's just the rebels that would have the Russian weapons. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the, the government that, I, that the United States supports. Yes, exactly. And they had to have been hand-delivered by Putin. You know? And th- what's amazing is for all of these uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that we spent on intelligence... These are not these are not little suitcase weapons. These launchers are massive, and it's not just on one truck. It has several support trucks as part of a team. You know, it has to have radar backup. I mean, these are seriously sophisticated uh, compared to what the rebels had used up until this point, weaponry. So you're telling me that the U.S. does not in possession of any satellite photos of anything to back up its claims that these were delivered by Putin to the rebels who were instructed on how to use them and told to shoot down a passenger plane. You know, talk about a conspiracy theory. Yeah. I'm certainly willing to believe it if they have some some evidence, if they have satellite photos, which, of course, they do have, because as Jane's uh, Defense Weekly tells us, the U.S. has been flying AWACS over the area since March. Yeah. Uh, so they most certainly do have this information. Why are they withholding it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Another point that Dr. Paul pointed out that one of the things they will not tell us uh, is that uh, Kiev has, according to uh, certain some monitors that, that follow the situation, killed some 250 people in the breakaway uh, Lugansk region uh, since June, uh, including 20 killed as government forces bombed the city center the day after the plane crash. So, so 250 people that Kiev has been responsible for killing is almost the same number of people that were brought down in the aircraft. That's, and that's just in Lugansk. You know, as of, uh, as of Monday, uh, which is very interesting, as all the attention is on whether the investigators uh, will get through and be able to conduct an investigation, which it looks like they, they have done despite what Obama claims. But as this is happening, everyone's discussing this, the Kiev forces are shelling Donetsk, which is a city of a million people, and they've killed already dozens of, of civilians in Donetsk. Nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about the fact that I think it was on Monday, uh, Kiev completely blew up the administrative center in the city of Lugansk. Wow. You know, they're using these Grad rockets on civilian targets, um, not unlike what's happening over in Gaza, 
but simply no one is paying attention because the U.S. media is completely ignoring it. So the idea that they have any scruples about decimating a civilian population should be swept aside by their behavior. Right, and hence then, um, you know, why, I, I'm, it, it sort of beats me, Daniel, why are those 250 people in the breakaway Lagansk region uh, of little or no concern to us, whereas the people in that aircraft are? Sure, and the, uh, the same was with civilians in Iraq when uh, the U.S. invaded and so on and so on. These are just collateral damage. Yeah, we kill, America kills so many people in these wars. It's not reported. We we don't, of course, report very much anymore our own soldiers that come back either. Uh, that is, is during the Vietnam days, that was always reported how many people died, but uh, we don't get that news anymore. We're not supposed no, no. to know. No, that's, that's, that's not the... <laughs> Another point, uh, they will not report that the U.S. has strongly backed the Ukrainian government in these attacks on civilians, uh, which the State Department spokesman called measured and moderate. Uh, just as you're saying, uh, we, are, we are measured and moderate. We don't, we don't do bad things, and, and maybe once in a while a person dies, but it's, and that's too bad, and we're very, very, very sorry about that. But, uh, no, we, we treasure human life, and uh, so. Yeah, this was... This was the State Department spokes, spokeswoman, Jen Psaki, who was really sort of the chemical Ali of, uh, of U.S. foreign policy. You know, if you remember the fellow in the Iraq War who yeah. kept uh, doing these outrageous briefings that everyone knew were so completely fabricated. I mean, that's the role that she's taken. And, and this was an extraordinary moment in a State Department briefing where uh, one brave reporter had the courage to actually mention all of these civilian deaths that were taking place at the hands of the U.S.-backed government in Kiev, and she said, well, we think that government's response is measured and moderate. Yeah. Well, here's one that Ron says that they won't report that I believe, Daniel, I've heard someone just a few minutes ago on CNBC actually reporting or making this statement, and that is that they will not report that, that neither Russia or the separatists in eastern Ukraine have anything to gain but everything to lose by shooting down a passenger liner. I, I actually, in all fairness to the media that I listen to here, a few minutes ago, somebody after uh, President Obama spoke uh, actually came out and said it's hardly, it hardly seems uh, that, uh, that, the, uh, that the separatists or, or Putin would really want this to happen because what it's really do doing is, uh, uh, is stimulating a lot of anger against Russia that wasn't there before. And certainly there was a, a lot of resistance in Europe uh, to the sanctions that President Obama was pushing for, right? So, Yeah, there won't be any more. <laughs> Uh, there won't be what was that? There won't be. There any won't more. be any more resistance. As a matter of fact, the Dutch have already talked about uh, going in and invading Russia or something. So, they're, they're, they're clearly all of this has melted away at this point. So but, if you if, if you look at this thing logically, then uh, you you could uh, you know you could make a case for geopolitically this being a fantastic coup for the United States and for the for the people that want to put to pin Putin back and and to, uh, and to take over. The Ukraine. Well, this is also a great coup for the very shaky government in Kiev, right? Put into place by the U.S. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, you know, the prime minister who was uh, the favorite of Victorian Newland, if you remember in that yes. intercepted conversation, he is uh, he's already been making the rounds, uh, using this to political advantage. He said to in the uh, July 21st LA Times. He said, quote, Russia trained these bastards and supported them and even orchestrated this despicable crime. And then he went on to say, um, this is a global threat and Russia is on the dark side. Right. Uh, the, <laughs> the priority of the world should be to stop Russian aggression. And here's yeah. what's interesting is that the, President Obama had a press conference the same day that these uh, comments were released. And what Yatsenyuk said completely tracks with, with what Obama said. He said, this is not just a conflict between Ukraine and Russia. This is an international and global conflict. And that is almost word for word what Obama said. Wow. And I think this represents an enormous escalation, and I think it's paving the way for a global confrontation to say that, hey, this isn't between Russia and Ukraine anymore. Uh, this is all of a sudden a threat to the entire international community. Wow. What a it's chilling. What a what a big lie! I mean, that's just ridiculous. But it seems it strikes me, Daniel, as though uh, if the separatist and Putin could not have given the Ukrainian government and the United States, the Anglo-American Empire, a bigger gift 
than they did if they did if they if they were responsible for that. I mean, they couldn't have done something more stupid for their own cause. Yeah, if it was a, if it was a terrible tragic mistake, right? Then uh, then you're right because no matter what that was, it would have been handed. If it were something intentional, I I, I just how I would have, it be? What would be the point? Yeah. But, but you know what the Western media does is it demonizes uh, the the hated person of the day, whether it's uh, Assad or Hussein or anyone. Right. You demonize them to the point where the American people, or at least a lot of them, believe that that person is totally irrational. Right. So rational, crazy people do crazy things. Right. Why did why did why did Putin personally shut shot down the plane? Because he's crazy. Right. That's why. And he's That's full of hatred. Not yeah. unlike us, we're loving and caring people. He's full of hatred and he's crazy. That's why he did it. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's it's so bizarre. The propaganda is so shocking uh, that you almost feel like you're living in an alternative reality. Yeah. Um, anything else that Ron pointed out here? I think there's something about the uh, missile that apparently shot down the plane was from a sophisticated surface-to-air missile system that requires a good deal of training, and the separatists do not have that training. Do we know that for sure? The separatists are, are not trained to use these sophisticated weapons? Well, they would have had to have had significant Russia training, uh, uh -huh. or they would have had to have, have had a lot of experience uh, in using these weapons beforehand. Uh, but, you know, this is a, basically a ragtag army. Uh, some of them do have military training because they do have conscription, mm -hmm. but this is very specialized training. So in the, cor in the course of, uh, say, six weeks or so that this has been ongoing in this, in, to this uh, intensity, you would have had to have some very, very significant training of these, of these uh, sort of ragtag militias in how to operate these things. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very, uh, and they, they've also been having, you know, pretty good success using these shoulder-fired missiles against Ukrainian transport planes and jets that are flying lower. Yes. But you also have to wonder what is the what is the point of having something like that when 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 uh, typically jet fighters do not fly at those altitudes. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it just, yeah, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, another thing, they will not report that the separatists in the eastern Ukraine have inflicted very considerable losses on the Ukrainian government. No, we don't hear that, do we? We don't hear uh, that the separatists sometimes uh, have been successful militarily. They don't. We don't hear much about that, but that would have given the Ukrainian government uh, some motives for retribution. Des desperation. Uh, and desperation. This is where it really tracks with what happened, if you remember, last summer in Syria. Which the, I mean, the scenario is, is almost shockingly similar. Uh, the, the forces of President Assad had made some serious, serious inroads against the U.S.-backed um, rebels in Syria. And that was, the, that was the point. As they were winning, and they've continued to win since then, but as they began really winning this thing, that's when this so-called gas attack in Ghouta occurred uh -huh. and the, that's where the US had the remember the red line and we were ready to go to war with Syria over this it was the exact same scenario and it was the exact same question of who benefits why mm. on earth just as he's gaining the upper hand would Assad do something that would make right. him so reviled by the international community right you know? I recall that yes and it's the same thing now just as see what happened in, in Ukraine over the past week was that uh, Poroshenko the president uh, announced this, a surprise attack, and what he was trying to do was to outflank the uh, the Ukrainian, uh, the separatists in the east, by by putting by shoving his troops between the border of Russia and where the separatists had their 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 sort of stronghold, mm -hmm. and they were going to try to strangle him. But what happened is that the the separatists were able to anticipate this attack, and they had about five thousand forces from Kiev trapped between the Russian border and the areas that they held. Uh -huh. And this was uh, threatening to be a, a route. And this is actually the scenario just a day or two before the shoot-down, huh. was this threatened route of an enormous amount of troops from Kiev. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, really, it really does raise an awful lot of questions, uh, Daniel. They, they will not report, another thing that Ron Paul pointed out, they will not report how similar this is to last summer's, well, that's exactly what you were saying, the similarity with Assad. Yeah, uh, and the Syrian situation, and how uh, you know, once the uh, the other side was making some real progress, is when we uh, we were able, or, or I don't know if that we were able, if I'm putting it the right way, it the events took place that really turned the opinion against 
uh, Assad, and in, in this case against the rebels. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it's yeah, it was it was it's very very uh, interesting uh, uh, parallels. The other thing that's interesting about that that's somewhat of a parallel is you know there was an extraordinary media briefing on Monday by a senior member of the Russian military staff, mm -hmm. uh, complete with satellite photos with um, with information from air traffic control showing that the um, that the forces of Kiev were using uh, su uh, they detected a Sukhoi fighter just right underneath the plane moments mm -hmm. before it uh, disappeared from the sky. Uh, they also showed that the um, that the uh, missiles were fired from area that had been controlled by the Ukrainian government by Kiev. Uh, but now the response of Obama yesterday after this was simply to echo the point that he made after the Syria attack, which is the people on the ground are interfering with the international investigation. What do they have to hide? Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. who's hiding what is, is the real question. And, um, uh, and interestingly enough, by the way, the, the Russians yesterday did say to the Americans, we know you have these satellite images. Uh, please release them. You know? Right. I mean, and the Russians have them, and they have released them. They have released them. They but of course, the, but of course, they're not. That's not being told either in the in the uh, in our press. We're not seeing those those, yeah. and well, we're not. Those are not being commented on. From of course, they're coming from Russia, Daniel. We couldn't. They couldn't be truthful. That's right. They're only all, truth. Truth only comes from the United States. And of course, if the Russians did it, they would lie and try to cover it up. As of with, course, that's what anyone. They wouldn't say, "Yeah, we did it." It wasn't a great. Right. Of course, they would. Right. But right. let's have the facts. Let's have the U.S. present its present its intelligence, present what it has, what it's holding, so that we can try to decide. But you know, Daniel, the idea that Obama was saying that, uh, that essentially that the investigation is being hampered and not being uh, allowed to go forward, uh, in, in its integrity has been compromised, uh, would then always give us an excuse, essentially, to say, well, you can't know what the truth is. Yeah, exactly. So even if something, even if a smoking gun comes up, they can deny it by saying. They can just say, think? "Yeah, a smoking gun comes up." It, well, how do you know that that's true? Because they've uh, compromised the investigation. Yeah. Another very interesting article at the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, and, and listeners, I would really strongly suggest you go there because there's an awful lot of material in this one that was written by uh, uh, Paul Craig Roberts, an economist and uh, blogger who uh, was a high-level official in the Reagan administration. Uh, writes a, a great website, and I would encourage you to go there, too, directly, but the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity has an article that he wrote this past weekend called What Happened to the Malaysian Airliner? And uh, Paul Craig Roberts uh, gives some very, I think, very provocative, very interesting uh, thoughts about it, and but I think is very highly logical in the way he sets out his arguments and his uh, basically saying that it could be a false flag. Daniel, would you care to comment a little bit on, on Paul Craig Roberts' article? Well, I thought it was, uh, obviously, I thought it was a great article, as are many of his articles. Uh, I, I don't know whether it was a false flag or not, but it certainly would fit in with a pattern. I mean, certainly, the first question you'd ask is, who benefits and mm -hmm. who doesn't benefit? And, uh, you know, if just, just that question alone should, should raise a red flag. Sure. You know? Yeah. Well, it's it's an article I think is very well worth reading, and um, I think he he lays out the uh, some very very considerable questions that are not being asked by our media. We don't ask questions. Our media doesn't ask questions; it just gives you the truth. It regurgitates what is told to them on high from on high, and then we are supposed to just like sheeple follow it, believe it, trust it, pay our taxes, shut our mouths, and be good citizens, right? It exactly. sounds a little contrary to the Constitution, but... Uh, well, it's also dangerous for journalists who want to try to buck the trend, you know. I mean, I hopefully I didn't tell this story before, but I remember when I was a journalist working in, in Eastern Europe, and, and I saw a, um, a coup in one of those countries happen, and everything was totally the opposite of the way it was being reported. Mm -hmm. I ran into an AP friend of mine, and I told her what I'd just seen in the, in the field, and she said, but nobody else is reporting that. Yeah. So that's... That's, why would I stick my neck out? Why would I yeah. something that goes against all of my colleagues? It's it's not good for your career. Yeah. Well, you know, this is very, th along those lines, Daniel, in the article from Paul Craig Roberts, he says, look around for still honest journalists. Who are they? Glenn Greenwald, who is under constant attack by his fellow journalists, all of whom are whores. Mm -hmm. Who else can you think of that are honest journalists? Julian Assange, 
Well, he's locked away in the Ecuadorian embassy in London on, Washington, on Washington's orders. And he goes on to say, the British puppet government won't permit free transit to Assange to take up his asylum in Ecuador. Yeah, the last exactly. yeah, so the last country that did this was the Soviet Union, which required its Hungarian puppet to keep Cardinal uh, Minzensky uh, interred in the U.S. Embassy in Budapest for 15 years from 1956 to 1971. And then it says that, that Minzensky was granted political asylum by the United States, but Hungary, on Soviet orders, would not honor his asylum, just as Washington's uh, British puppet on Washington's orders will not honor Assange's asylum. And then he says, and I think this is really a, a good way to end this discussion today perhaps, but he says, if we are honest and have the strength to face reality, we will realize that the Soviet Union did not collapse. It simply moved along with Mao and Pol Pot to Washington and London. My okay. goodness, what a statement. But I have been feeling this, Daniel, that that is what's happening that we have become the Soviet Union in so many ways. We are moving in that direction, it seems to me, very rapidly. But, but, not, but not we, Jay, the government. That's the one thing I would... I would well, say. you're absolutely right about that. But, you know, we are complicit in it, in that we, the citizens, uh, aren't more concerned than we are, I think. It's, it's not unpatriotic to point it out. On the, on the contrary, it is, it is the most patriotic thing to point out. Absolutely. Is, is defying its own principles. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the forces of history, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But, uh, Daniel, I think it's, it's all about speaking up for what's true. Um, and, I mean, that's what we have to do, I think. I mean, I'm driven by that. I know you are. I know Dr. Paul is, for sure. A lot of good people are. Paul Craig Roberts, certainly, and those journalists uh, that come forth. Some people, for whatever the reasons, it's their... Uh, it, it's their genes or whatever. Uh, they are people. Some people feel compelled to tell the truth, even when it might be uh, not very self-serving. But yeah. I want to thank you, Daniel, for uh, for your efforts. Anything else to add uh, before we just, uh, before we end our conversation today? I just hope and pray that this does not escalate further, because this is incredibly, incredibly terrifying, uh, and I don't think people realize the consequences of of what of what Washington is up to. No, I, I don't think people do either, and the sense that we are omnis omnipotent and, of course, omniscient, our president, that's the idea. That's We don't question anything he says. Uh, and, and then uh, also, Daniel, what concerns me greatly, and we're going to talk to David Jensen in the next segment about this, but the idea that this comes on the heels of the BRIC announcement of setting up a competing uh, currency regime uh, and I believe very definitely that the United States, with its sanctions against Russia, is pushing Russia into the arms of China uh, and, and some of the other nations that are not so, so comfortable with the notion of a one-world government that's being, uh, that's being sought by, clearly by people, by NATO and the people that are the forces behind that. So, I mean, I guess there's nothing new in history, Daniel. Uh, countries have, uh, empires have always tried to get as much as they could and push the envelope, push their... Uh, their control uh, globally, if possible, right? So this is nothing new in history, right? But yeah. there comes an end to it at some point. Well, we're broke, so that might be the end. <laughs> yeah, and the end uh, may not be very comfortable as we sit here in America right now and enjoy our still good life. But we, as you say, I share your your hopes and prayers that uh, that this doesn't escalate further. Somehow, God on high can intervene and keep this thing from spinning out of control because it looks to me... Uh, very, very dangerous. I want to thank you very again, Daniel, very much for sharing your time and your thoughts and your insights with our listeners. I look forward to talking to you again in the near future, next week, hopefully. Thanks for having me, Jay. 